Hey everyone, Cam from Odell here. Uh, thanks for joining us for the latest edition of our Isolation Intelligence webinar series. Today we have a really exciting and uh, much anticipated topic. Uh, Aaron Engel from Fresh Air UV is going to be talking to us about indoor air quality and how we can use UV in our systems to uh, to treat the pathogens that could possibly be in your building systems. Um, just before we get started here, if you have any questions, we're going to address those at the end, but you can ask your questions on the right hand side in the questions pane. If you if you have a question that you want to address right away, uh, there's also an option to put your hand up. If you do that, I'll just cut into uh, Aaron's presentation and we can address that within the context of what he's talking about. Um, just like with all of our webinars, the recording of this will be available on our website sometime tomorrow uh, and you can uh, you can go back and, and take a look at it. So uh, I'm going to let Aaron take it over here. Without further ado, here's Aaron Engel. Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Cam. And uh, thank you, everyone at Odell, for inviting uh, Fresh Air UV to present to, um, to Odell and, and your, your customers. So it is a, a very exciting time for those in, in air quality and especially us in the uh, ultraviolet industry. And we're going to be reviewing some of the fundamentals of the technology, how the systems could be applied to an HVAC system, uh, primarily for commercial and uh, healthcare. And certainly, we believe when you leave the presentation, you'll be certainly a lot more informed on how ultraviolet does, especially in the context of what we're dealing with now, which obviously is a, is a greater awareness of air quality, certainly as a result of COVID-19. So I always like to start off a, a presentation really just um, introducing the group to Fresh Air UV, who we are. We are one of, if not the largest providers of UV systems in North America. We are very proud. I, I often call this the crown jewel of, of IAQ headquarters of HQ. And it's, it's quite impressive. We do everything in-house. We have 30,000 square feet, very robust sales, marketing, production, R&D. Our research and development team is second to none, and we'll touch on that towards the end of the slide presentation. But what we want our customers to uh, appreciate and understand is that we are the leaders in ultraviolet disinfection. And we do go uh, above and beyond to make sure our customers are well taken care of. This is just a few images over the course of the last year. The top left corner is a few of us at the AHR Expo in Orlando. That's myself in the black suit, black shirt, right behind the, the new sign. Uh, of course, we're being situated in, in Jupiter, Florida. We oftentimes do uh, provide tours and we have a lot of out of towners, especially in February, who come down to Jupiter. And this is an example of, of the tours that we give at the facility. So again, uh, hopefully you, you will learn you will leave this presentation learning a little bit at a, leave learning a little bit more about fresh air UV. Certainly what has prompted this is uh, COVID-19. And you know there's gonna be a lot of debate in the in the months to come and maybe a year to come and how um, the, the virus is transmitted, but rest assured that ultraviolet itself is very effective at disinfecting and irradiating and inactivating the virus. There is no pathogen that we know that is resistant to ultraviolet and COVID-19 is no different. Now, what we do not know presently is what the UV dosage requirement is for inactivation of COVID-19, but certainly there are other coronaviruses that do already have a defined uh, uh, inactivation rate. Uh, corona, uh, COVID SARS is a perfect example of that back in 2004. So it's not a question of, of is ultraviolet effective? It certainly will be. The discussion will be how is COVID-19, how is coronavirus transmitted? What are the vectors? Is it solely through touch? Is it uh, droplets? Is it you know, transmitted through the HVAC system? Is it in the air current? And that's going to be a topic of discussion for some time to come. But what we can attribute to coronavirus is the fact that the industry, the awareness is second to none. The air quality industry has been changed forever. There is now such an importance on the air that we're breathing, the air within our facilities, even with our, our homes, 
are now taking a priority. And we could tell you that from firsthand experience and that our, our sales and our demand is up over 10 times. We were very strong moving into 2020. And once um, COVID-19 happened, it just it exploded for lack of a better term. So uh, obviously uh, being leaders in ultraviolet, we are providing UV systems to HVAC, you know, systems and, and facilities and healthcare facilities and even residential homes. But we were starting to get a very, very uh, a large increase in inquiries from healthcare providers. And that's not uncommon, but we were being required and, um, you know, asked to provide UV recommendations for disinfecting N95 and PPE. And we were doing that. We have very robust software that we run calculations on. So if you're a facility and you want to know how the UV system is addressing your HVAC equipment, your evaporator coil, we have our calculation software that will provide you real-time dosage and inactivation rates. And we were applying this software to N95 and PPE. And we were getting dozens and dozens of inquiries. We were getting do-it-yourselfers who happened to be first-line responders. As a matter of fact, the first picture you see on the left is a hospital in Georgia that uh, took their refrigerator from their cafeteria, made a few holes in them, and, and inserted our residential UV lights to disinfect N95s. The picture next to that is an ambulance first responder building their own disinfection box, and the examples go on and on and on. So we found ourselves in a very unique situation having to uh, provide our sizing guidelines to first line responders. And what we found out was that just a, a, a couple of years ago in 2018, when there really wasn't such a need for disinfecting PPE, there was the definitive study on the e efficiency of ultraviolet C, UVC germicidal light on disinfecting N95s. And in doing so, they're able to in essence, you know, um, extend the life of the PPE. And that really didn't mean very much in, in 2018, but in 2020, it's, it's a huge, huge issue. So what we found was that the American Journal of Infection Control did a large scale study on the effects of ultraviolet on N95s, and they used the UV system to disinfect all of the major brands of N95s on the marketplace. And what was so impressive about this is that when we found out what was used in the test rig it was our systems so it was uh, fresh air uv systems that were used in the american journal of infection control study that showed that applying the uvc light actually extended the life of the n95 and the fda and the uh, cdc came out with um guidelines on applying ultraviolet to n95s and they were citing this study among two or three others of its efficacy so we were in a very very unique situation having to address our hvac customers but at the same time providing uv systems for first responders and healthcare providers and that's where we find ourselves even today so i'm just gonna really just you know uh, just bring you a little bit up to speed of on fresh air uv uh, we are as i mentioned the leading provider of these types of systems in north america since 2001, over a million UV installations worldwide. We have multiple patents. And what we're known for in the industry is the fact that our systems are exceptionally reliable. Uh, we, we oftentimes offer a lifetime warranty on most of our systems because they are that robust. And the last thing we want in the field, and this is a part of our philosophy, this is how we started, this is what we believe in, we do not want to have any issues where the contractor has to try to troubleshoot what's going on with the end user. Is it a power supply? Is it a lamp? Is it the electronics? Is the, is the plug? So we made it very, very simple. If there's any problem with the system over the course of its life, we typically just swap it out. That's what we will do. And because of the robust nature of fresh air UV systems, that certainly happens very, 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 very rare. So our systems are designed for HVAC. It's not something even on our residential side that you'll find in big box retail. So it is a, a system designed for the HVAC industry. I always like to talk about air quality. Why is it that these systems are so important? And certainly this slide has been around for many, many years, long before COVID-19. What we are pleased about, if anything, is the awareness that 
the coronavirus has brought to the marketplace. Air quality has always been exceptionally important. I'm just not sure if it was really, um, you know, understood the level of importance regarding the air that we're breathing. If this was 40, 50 years ago, we would not need a UV system. We were naturally bringing in fresh outside air, diluting the concentration of contaminants within the building. But obviously we're looking to improve equipment efficiency. We're looking to reduce our carbon footprint. We're looking to save resources. So we're buttoning everything up. Everything is sealed so very tight and we're not doing enough to bring in fresh outside air from outside. And, you know, uh, we should be opening our doors, we should be opening our windows, we should be diluting the concentration of contaminants within the envelope of the building, but we're not doing it. Some would argue that the reason why there's such a rise in allergy and asthma related illnesses is because we're insulating ourselves like never before. It, it's a huge, huge, huge issue. So what we're looking to do is try to find ways to mitigate, to help alleviate the bacteria, the virus, the mold, the chemicals, the odors, the VOCs that are all trapped within the envelope of the building. And those concentrations of contaminants continually build and build and build. Research shows that the air within our buildings and facilities could be oftentimes five times, but up to a hundred times more polluted than outside. It is a huge, huge issue. Now, if we were to look at the cross-section of contaminants that are in the air that we're breathing, 35% would be particulate, dust and dander and dirt. And that's addressed by the system's HVAC filter. But 65% of what's in the air, the bacteria, the viruses, the mold, the chemicals, the odors, the VOCs, they all pass through a filter like sand through a tennis racket. So it's not a question of competing with filtration or filtration competing with ultraviolet. It, it, it really is a synergistic approach that's part of a complete IAQ puzzle. It's using good quality filtration for the particulate and for what is not addressed by the filter, we're using ultraviolet light. It's part of a complete IAQ puzzle. And that's really how we want to frame the conversation. Uh, typically when you talk to a, a facility and you ask them, what are you doing about the air quality in here? Well, we're, we're on, on top of our PM, we, we change our filters when we have to but maybe not necessarily understanding that the filter in itself is not addressing all those other contaminants that an ultraviolet system addresses. Certainly a filter is there to protect the equipment. It's not even there to protect the occupant's health. Unless you're dealing with HEPA filtration in a hospital level, filters are really designed to keep the equipment running to spec. And if we didn't have filters, they would fail. So filters, number one priority is to protect the equipment. The second obviously is, well, if we're removing particulates in the air that we're breathing, it's an air quality product. But ultraviolet in itself is a great adjunct to complementing what is happening already with the system's HVAC filter. So we're applying UV light to address the biologicals. We're using something called PCO photocatalytic oxidation to address chemicals, odors, and VOCs. And of course, we're relying on filtration for particulates. I always enjoy talking about the fundamentals of UV. Um, it's amazing how much awareness there is UV about UV now in, in the media. I'm seeing it on Fox News, on CNN, NBC, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, a lot of people are getting very, very educated on ultraviolet, but there's still a lot of misinformation out there. If I was to take a picture of the sun with a UV camera, it'd be a fierce blue. That's because the sun produces four wavelengths of UV light, UVA, UVB, UVC, and UVB. We're very aware of UVA and UVB because that's the wavelength we're protecting ourselves from. Our sunscreen, our sunglasses, the front window of your car is the only window that actually has a UVA and UVB filter incorporated into the glass. So we're very cognizant about A and B. UVA and UVB, as dangerous as, as it appears, it's not anywhere near as efficient as far as a germicidal wavelength than as UVC. Now, UVA and UVB have very little germicidal properties. One sunburn will not be an issue, but multiple sunburns over the course of someone's life will have the accumulated dosage to the point of mutation, which presents itself as skin cancer. So UVA and UVB have very, very, very little germicidal properties. UVC, on the other hand, is exceptionally effective at disinfection. It's a very, it uh, has a lot of germicidal power. We are never subjected to UVC. It's absorbed by the ozone layer. 
So when we hear about the importance of the integrity of the ozone layer, why there should never be a hole or the thinning of the ozone layer, that would allow that UVC light to penetrate the ground level and kill all living organisms on the planet. So UVC is exceptionally effective at disinfecting and sterilizing. And we're taking that UVC light and we're applying it to inside the HVAC system. A fourth wavelength called UVV or vacuum UV is an ozone producing wavelength. So if you come across a UV system that promotes odor, chemical or VOC reduction, it's typically because that UV wavelength or the wavelength that they are using is an ozone producing wavelength. We do not produce ozone. We produce the UVC wavelength at 254 nanometers. So if we were to look at the spectrum of light from blue to red, the visible spectrum in the invisible below 400 is where the ultraviolet wavelengths lie. And we're using the 254 nanometer wavelength, non-ozone germicidal wavelength for our disinfection. Now, UV has been used for 100 years. Uh, many of our municipal water treatment centers use UV to disinfect the water. Funny enough, hospital and healthcare were using UV in all kinds of innovative ways in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I've seen uh, antique Westinghouse UV systems. They look very much like today's UV systems, except the one I saw had this big cast iron control box with these big thick UV tubes. But rest assured, it was a UV system very similar to what we use today. And healthcare was using UV to disinfect surfaces for tools. They were using it for duct work and for rooms. And in the 60s and 70s, it fell out of favor. Healthcare pulled back completely on UV because if anyone gets sick, well, you know, we'll just give them antibiotics. We don't have to go through that level of disinfection, sterilizing surfaces. And uh, that was the case for many, many years until recently where you have superbugs. You have pathogens that are resistant to antibiotics. MRSA, C. diff, VRE, these are an example of pathogens that antibiotics may not be effective. So hospitals are looking at ways to control and reduce hospital-associated infections, HAIs, and they've come full circle, embracing UV like never before. In the bottom right corner is our ceiling mount unit, which is designed for unoccupied spaces. So the environmental services cleaning crew comes in and does their cleaning after, uh, you know, after a patient uh, leaves or after a procedure. And then they turn the UV light on for 20 minutes or so to disinfect high-touch areas. There's UV robots that are entered into a room to disinfect high touch areas. And of course, UV for HVAC. And I'd be hard pressed to see if they don't, if you yourself don't have UV in your local healthcare facilities. So it's taking those UV lights and applying it to the HVAC system. How does ultraviolet light work? How does UV actually disinfect? Well, oftentimes when I'm doing a presentation in, in person, I look around for someone who has a coat with a zipper. And I've, I always point them out and I say, if I was to break that zipper, you cannot zip up your jacket. Well, that's what we're doing to the DNA of the microorganism. UVC has the ability to penetrate through the cellular membrane and scramble and break the DNA structure so it cannot replicate. And if you're able to do that, you could either kill the target or you could cause enough damage to the DNA or RNA that can replicate. So if it's a bacteria, it can't replicate. If it's a virus, it can't infect. And we're taking that UVC light and we're applying it to the, uh, obviously to the air and to the equipment and to surfaces. And that's how we're able to do what we do. The reason why healthcare, contractors, distributors, uh, engineers uh, really, really do embrace UV is the fact that it's quantifiable. There are a lot of products that are coming out to market now and even more so once they start you know marketing and doing what they do to um, you know to capitalize on the pandemic that are making all kinds of wild crazy claims uh, I've seen uh, I've seen systems being promoted as active oxidizers and hunter molecules that will go into the living space and ion generation that will kill microbes on on your countertop and a cutting board on your phones and this is, this is just, it, it really is crazy and it, it is becoming the wild west. And the reason why UV is so embraced is because it's quantifiable, it's replicatable, it's validated. What you see there is a partial list of microwatts needed for inactivation. Certain, uh, uh, every biological contaminant has a certain amount of dosage needed for inactivation. Sometimes it's measured in microwatts, sometimes it's measured in joules. In this, for this uh, conversation, we'll look at microwatts.
So if we're looking at this cross section of, 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 of microorganisms, an example, Legionella, as you see there, requires around 3000 microwatts for inactivation. Microwatts is the power of my UV lamp. And if I look at Aspirillus niger on the right side of the, uh, of the chart, that requires 330,000 microwatts. So when we talk about destroying or killing or inactivating or disinfecting, we have to be very cognizant about what kind of power requirement or what the dosage requirement is for inactivation. And that is what's so uniquely uh, genuine about ultraviolet is that I know for my units to be effective for inactivating Aspirillus niger on your air handling coil, I know that I have to deliver that lethal dosage. If I'm talking about ozone or ions or plasma or uh, hunter molecules, there's no way to quantify. You have no idea how much you have to produce to get any sort of uh, disinfection rate. So the calculation is really quite simple. It's time times intensity. Uh, the longer the exposure time, the more UV I could deliver to that target. Uh, the more power my UV source, the more UV I could deliver to that target. So it really is a question of time times intensity equals the kill rate. And every biological contaminant will have that lethal um, dosage for inactivation. Again, what we don't know today is exactly what the COVID-19 requires, but it's going to be in the same ballpark as coronavirus, and it certainly will not require very much UV for inactivation. This is a test I've done hundreds of times. Uh, they go by any number of names, contact plate, agar plate, test plate. What's nice about this particular model is that the gelatin on the agar is actually bowed. So you're able to press it into surfaces. So oftentimes we will visit a healthcare facility, uh, as an example, and uh, we'll always ask permission. And we'll ask, is it okay if we you know, uh, do a test? And they're always, always game, always, always interested. And, and oftentimes I'll, I'll meet up with a facility director that is so proud of, of their, of their uh, equipment, of their coil. And they're like, Aaron, you can see for yourself, we, we don't really need UV. Look how clean our evaporator coil is. And, and I ask for permission and, they, and I get it. And I take two of these discs and because the gelatin's bowed, I'm able to press it into the fins of the coil. The fins of the coil slice into the gelatin and I take off the cap, I, I cap it, I tape it. I give him one, I, I keep one and, and you put it in a, in a drawer for three or four days. And then I call Mark up and I say, Mark, have you checked out your, your contact plate? And always they forget that that's for some reason it's important in the moment and then they forget. He goes, oh yeah, Aaron, that's right, I forgot about it. So I'll, I'll wait Mark while you grab it. And Mark's always, always quiet, silent. And, and I know what's going on. I ask him what's 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 the deal, and and he says, well, I'm shocked to see what's growing on my uh, on my on my disc. And I say, well, that's indicative of what's happening in your in your uh, coil. When you look at a coil, that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what's happening? The, the ten, there's tens and tens of thousands of square feet that's below the water that you don't see, just like an iceberg is below the water, the most of the surface area. And although you, the coil may look clean to you, it, it certainly isn't. And we go back to Mark's facility and we put a UV light on their evaporator coil and you do the same test 10 hours later, you turn off the light after 10 hours, do the same test and it will be a 99.9% .9 reduction. The UV light will just stop the growth in its tracks and from there start disinfecting and breaking down any sort of microbial biofilm on that evaporator coil. And it could happen over and over again. The results are always the same. Again, it's a mathematical certainty. So if there's anything that you learn when you leave this presentation, and of course, we're all talking about COVID-19 and viruses are top of mind, but the reality of things, what has been driving the UV industry all these years is keeping the equipment clean and sterile. There's a source of pathogens. There's a contamination that's being introduced into the facility on an ongoing basis when you have a coil and drain pan that is prone to mold and microbial load. Some of the most common testimonials we get at our office post installation for residential is I've not slept this well in 20 years. I would argue the reason why many of us wake up congested with a tickle in our throat with a headache is because that contamination from the air handling unit is being introduced into our living area. And there's data that supports that a large percentage of what is in our buildings in our homes is a result of the growth from the equipment itself. So please, if there's anything you learn from today, UV on the evaporator coils, it's a must. Uh, a lot has happened in UV in the last little bit. Uh, the most important 
definitely is ASHRAE including um, ultraviolet in their handbook in 2008. And since 2008, I believe there's been nine chapters in ultraviolet lamp systems. And there are thousands of specifications been written every year on ultraviolet. I myself am a member of uh, TC 2.9 ultraviolet lamp systems. I'm a voting member of that TC. I'm also the chair of the programs committee on ultraviolet. So I'm intimately involved with what's going on with ASHRAE and ultraviolet, and there's a lot happening. There's a lot of exciting programs that are coming out through the ASHRAE pipeline on ultraviolet. And if you do visit the ASHRAE resource on COVID-19, ultraviolet holds a very respectable part of that um, of, of the resource chapter on, on COVID-19. So ASHRAE is very much um, embracing UV. The CDC in the US does mandate UV for uh, um, tuberculosis applications. The GSA, the General Service Administration, again in the US, responsible for all government buildings, mandates UV on new building construction for their air handlers. Uh, LEED, Green Building, does have UV points available to them. And a, a slightly newer standard, the, bell, uh, the well building standard, is really um, a variation of, of LEED and green, green Build, where well building standard takes the wellness of the occupant's health as the priority. Oftentimes, we're doing so much to insulate ourselves in a building to save on resources and our carbon foot, reduce our carbon footprint and so forth, that we're just not really taking the occupant's health as a priority. The well building standard does do just that, and they're very heavily invested in ultraviolet as well. This is a slide that I took for my cannabis presentation. We do a lot in the way of cannabis. And when I say cannabis, I mean uh, disinfecting the air. There are problematic molds and fungus that are very, very uh, difficult to address for grow facilities. And ultraviolet has the ability to address those pathogens, uh, specifically uh, powdery mildew. And they are very, very heavily interested in ultraviolet technologies. This is a slide that I really use to make that, um, that connection between what we've been doing for 20 years for healthcare and what we can be doing for a growth facility. Certainly, one of the uh, overriding factors why UV should be used and why it's used for healthcare is to reduce, as I mentioned, hospital associated infections. Billions and billions of dollars a year are lost in uninsurable uh, costs because a patient gets sick in, while in the hospital, and, and a hospital wants to do the best to keep that patient obviously healthy and not get leave sicker than they were when they when they entered the facility. And by by implementing UV in a healthcare facility, we're able to control and and really move the needle. We're able to help address those pathogens, and we could do the same thing for a grow facility. Put UV lights in the air handling unit that is the uh, cause, or at the very least, distribute that powdery mildew through the facility. And if we're able to disinfect the air, we could stop that cross contamination. So we understand that UVC light is very effective for sterilization for disinfection. Um, there is no pathogen on the planet that has been shown to be um, uh, you know, safe from ultraviolet. Ultraviolet will be able to inactivate everything and anything. So we use it for bacteria, viruses, mold, uh, microorganisms, and fungus. What do we do about odors? And, and that's where we switch gears and we look at activated carbon. So we do have a line of product that does incorporate activated carbon into the UV system. And that really is to address the VOCs, chemicals, odors without producing ozone. And the reason why IAQ manufacturers really embrace carbon technologies because it's got an amazing amount of volumetric surface area. There's micropores and macropores and a lot of surface area that allows for that chemical and VOC to be absorbed. This is an example of one of our systems that has a combined total of 162 grams of activated carbon. Not very much, uh, but in all reality, it's the equivalent of 630,000 square feet or 10 football fields worth. That's why activated carbon is embraced by IQ manufacturers because a little bit goes a long way. There's just so much volumetric area for adsorption that activated carbon makes a huge difference for controlling odors and smells and things of that nature. The limiting factor of activated carbon is much like a, a sponge. Once a sponge is saturated, it becomes ineffective. Well, the same is true for activated carbon. Once an activated carbon becomes saturated, it's not going to soak up anything else and it has to be uh, replaced. It's a consumable. And that brings us to our third technology, which is called PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. So the first being UVC germicidal, number two being activated carbon, and number three being photocatalytic oxidation. 
Back in the uh, 20s and 30s, 1920s and 1930s, they used to paint barns and fences and siding and doors white. And they couldn't understand why after a few years would elapse, the white paint would flake off the side of the building or the fence or the door. And they realized that the pigment of white paint is titanium dioxide. And even today, the, the white pigment is, is titanium. And they realized that there was some sort of photocatalytic reaction between the sun, albeit UVA and UVB, and the white paint that was on the side of the fence, causing the chemicals, the adhesives, the binders to break down and the paint to flake off. And that was the birth of PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. It didn't happen with green paint. It didn't happen with blue paint. It didn't happen with red paint, only white paint. Fast forward so many years later, you have a wealth of companies out there that have UV lamps that are shining on a target, a pigment, a mesh, a grid, and it's called PCO, photocatalytic oxidation, designed to address chemicals, odors, and VOCs. And what Fresher UV did that was so unique 10 years ago and we won an, uh, an AHR Innovation Award for this, is that we took our UV light and we used that to disinfect and sterilize. And we used the activated carbon, not ozone, activated carbon to absorb the chemicals, odors, and VOCs in the airstream. And then we infused the activated carbon with titanium. And the reaction between the UV light and the titanium within the carbon would cause that photocatalytic reaction, breaking down the chemicals, odors, and VOCs, and releases it from the carbon. It releases it as CO2 and H2O. So what we actually have here is a carbon that has that, that that's permanent. It's got a lifetime working life. Uh, it regenerates itself. And that is what's so unique about fresher UVs that we're able to do the disinfection, we're able to do the odor control, and yet we're not producing any ozone and it's a lifetime carbon cell. Our first product we're gonna touch on is our APCO product. And we have a whole bunch of APCO systems. And for commercial, uh, we have two. The second one you'll see a little bit later in the presentation. This is our APCO mag, perfect for rooftops. And we're big on magnets in many ways. Obviously, it's you know not that these systems are very difficult to install, which they're not, but having a magnet, a 60 pound magnet makes it that much easier. So by using these systems, in this case on a rooftop unit, we're able to disinfect the evaporator coil and address the air. Now, I'm not gonna kid yourself, a system like this one lamp on this size system is not going to do very much for the air. We have other products that we're going to talk about that's going to be very effective for air disinfection. But as I started with our conversation on the equipment, the air handler, the coil, and we're going to learn very shortly how important it is to keep that coil clean and sterile, this system will do just that. We were the first uh, UV company to come out with an LED system for HVAC. And our first uh, foray into this uh, product, new, new product category, was our ductless uh, mini UV LED. So it's a 40 inch LED ribbon cut to length with a 3M adhesive backing that easily adheres to the inside or the, the ideal location is near the blower and it disinfects that blower. Quite often you have conditioned air that condenses on that blower wheel, that's prone to mold and microbial load, that becomes unsightly, there's an odor, it gets introduced into the living area. This is again, not really a disinfection system in the sense it's not designed to treat the air, it's designed to keep the surfaces within a ductless system clean and sterile. And it works very, very well for that. Now as, as, as much and as popular as LEDs are becoming, it's certainly not at the point where they're going to be taking the place of conventional mercury vapor UV lamps, the way that we are using it today. Uh, LEDs are great for close target disinfection. They're not really designed yet to have the output for uh, air, airstream disinfection. We have a lot of test data, a lot of research on most of our systems, if not all of them, in one way or another. And this is our, our, our research that, uh, testing that was done on our LED system. And this system works a little bit differently than our conventional UV systems, and it does take a long time for that inactivation rate. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on the chart of different microorganisms and the dosage requirements, we always choose the most robust um, uh, pathogen. In this case, Aspirillus niger. 
And the reason why we chose Asperger's Niger is because it's the hardest of all uh, spores to inactivate with ultraviolet, requiring 330,000 microwatts. So for this test, we did use it against Asperger's Niger. And as you can see, it took six hours for a two log reduction for a 99.9%. .9%. But we're okay with that because the design of this mini LED system is to keep the ductless clean. And we have all the time to treat that ductless. And that's why we're okay with that six uh, hour irradiation time. So that's the, the mini LED system that certainly always gets a lot of interest when we talk about it. It was the recipient of a number of, of industry awards, best technology of 2018. Uh, it was an AHR innovation award finalist. And we did win the dealer design award gold for this product. Uh, contractors and installers love using it. There's very few add-on accessories for ductless that you could put in to actually improve air quality. And this is, is, this is just one of them. For hospitality, for dormitories, army barracks, uh, these are very popular for PTAC terminal fan coil units. They're smaller UV systems, again with magnets that are designed for very small, tight spaces. I can't tell you how many hotels I've stayed in over the years that I wish I had a UV system installed in there. Very popular for dorms, especially come August or September when the students come back and they turn on the air handlers again after a hot, humid summer, and they have that humid, musty, mildewy smell that pours out of the equipment. Well, these are the solutions for those kind of issues. So we do very well uh, especially in hospitality, when a hotel pulls the trigger, they're doing all the rooms and they are quite large uh, orders when they do that. So we do have units specifically for small confined spaces. This is a product category I always enjoy talking about, even if the audience never touches an ice machine. It, it's always um, a, an interesting topic to say the least. So we do have a, a line of UV systems for ice machines. And I like talking about ice machines because it is indicative of what's happening inside an evaporator coil, inside an air handler. And uh, we are installed in some of Canada and US's largest providers of uh, gas, gas, uh, gas retailers. And in our concession stands, when you go in to get your, your beverage or whatever it is, uh, our UV systems are installed in our ice machines. And before they move forward to outfit their, uh, their facilities with ice UV, they want to see for themselves how effective these UV systems were on on ice machines. So they brought in two brand new ice machines. One they fitted with UV, those are the ice machines you're looking at with the blue outline. And uh, they brought in obviously the, the other one, the other new machine did not have the UV lights installed. After 10 months of operation, it was time to revisit both machines. And obviously uh, looking at the uh, the one on the left, it, it's, it's visibly slimy. It's got that microbial load, it is disgusting. And the ones with the blue uh, uh, outline obviously had the uh, UV light. You can kind of see them on the very top of the light uh, of the picture, and they are clean. And uh, a few years ago, the Today Show did a segment, America, what is the most contaminated thing you touch on a regular basis? And what caught my attention wasn't necessarily the, uh, the segment itself. It was the fact that they were using the same ATP tester I use. You can kind of see a picture of it in the bottom right corner. An ATP tester, for those that don't know, it looks like an ohmmeter with a Q-tip and you swab down a surface, you put that Q-tip inside the ATP tester and it gives you a numerical value and that measures proteins. And uh, the higher the number, the more contaminated that surface is. So they were going, it was the Ronson report and Mr. Ronson was going across the US from coast to coast, swabbing down things. And he's using the same tester that I have, and that's really what caught my attention. So he swabbed down toilet seats and doorknobs and buttons on elevators and handrails and vents on, on airplanes. And he said, America, the results are in. The most contaminated thing you could touch is not a toilet seat and not a doorknob and not your cell phone. It's the back seat of a Chicago taxi cab. And he made such a big deal about it because a toilet seat measured 200 RLUs relative light units, 200. But that Chicago taxi cab measured 4,000 RLUs. Well, I know that this ice machine measures 8,009 RLUs. This ice machine is twice as contaminated as the backseat of that Chicago taxi cab, which that test happened to be the same year Ashray was in Chicago. I remember that. The ice machine with UV light measured two. An ice machine is no different than an air handler, no different than evaporator coil, 
Anytime you have cold, damp, wet, dark places, you're going to have microbial load, you're going to have slime. And of course, this is pretty, um, you know, eye-opening, certainly because we all have ice in our beverages, and we all should be very cognizant and aware of what we're putting into our bodies. And with the results from this uh, loose test study that the uh, retailer did, they just, that's it. All our ice machines are going to have UV lights, and that's it, that's all. And that really is indicative of what's happening in our air handler. Uh, we have coils that are so tightly packed. Uh, we're using them obviously to, uh, you know, condition our air. And when those fins start getting fouled, which happens immediately, there's a loss in efficiency. Um, the system has to work harder to pull that air through those tightly packed fins. And as those fins get fouled and more fouled and more fouled, it, it starts on a microscopic level. We call it biofilm and it acts as an adhesive, and whatever particulates in the air, whatever makes it past the filter, will get you know, um, ad adhered to that biofilm. And it further insulates the fins of the coil, again, restricting more airflow. System has to work harder, loss of heat transfer. Uh, the end user wants the temperature at a certain, you know, just a certain temperature level, and the system has to work harder to keep it. There's wear and tear. So what happens? You bring in a company to pressure wash or chemical clean, and they clean that coil and it's running to spec and immediately it happens again. It's, a, it's an ongoing, it's a vicious, vicious circle and it's an ongoing uh, issue. And I don't care where you live, it could be Montreal, it could be Toronto, it could be Vancouver, it could be Birmingham, Alabama, which certainly has it worse than we do, but it's going to be an issue and it always is an issue. So as I mentioned earlier, we always wanna promote keeping the equipment clean and sterile Besides having the loss in efficiency, you also have the poor air quality and the biological blow up that gets introduced into the facility. So we're always promoting, put the UV systems on the evaporator coil and you will prevent uh, a microbial load. You will keep that coil clean and running to spec. You will save resources and energy and you will reduce wear and tear and you don't have to lose the guy on the roof cleaning coils all summer long. UV has an amazing ability to break down that biological growth and prevent any microbial load. And where, you know, oftentimes when I'm meeting with a facility, I tell them, give me your worst coil, give me your worst air handler. You want to do a test, we'll do a test. We're going to put UV in your worst air handler where you lose a guy every summer cleaning that coil. And when you put the UV light on there, the, the conventional coil cleaning is, is done. That's it. You could probably hose off the coil with a garden hose every two years instead of losing a guy for hours every every summer. So oftentimes I'm asked, well, should we clean the coil first and then mount the UV light? Well, obviously best practices would be, yes, clean the coil, mount the UV light, or if it's a brand new coil, mount the UV light before the system goes into operation. But the fact of the matter is, you don't have to. And I've seen countless applications where they just take the UV systems and they mount it on the coil. 90% of UV installations are retrofit. 90%, maybe 95%. This is a perfect example of, of that kind of application. You have a, an evaporator coil that's pretty foul, measuring just under 330 CFUs of biological contamination on that coil. Mount the UV system. And after a few weeks of operation, we did the post test. And there was a five log reduction. That's a 99.39, 99.999 reduction in uh, fungus and bacteria from 330,000 to two. Again, UV is a, it's a mathematical validated repeatable technology that very few other technologies could um, substantiate. So we do have two types of UV systems for uh, commercial systems. We have UV for the evaporator coil and we have UV for the airstream. And when we put them in the evaporator coil, it's gonna keep the coil sterile and clean. It's gonna keep the surfaces clean and sterile. And it's also gonna improve the air quality as the air continually recirculates through the building. And definitely everyone's calling us up and saying, we want to size for viruses. We wanna take care of COVID. We want coronavirus. We wanna take care of coronavirus. And it's always trying to, kind of manage expectations. Not everybody needs hospital grade air quality. If they want, we have the second unit, which is called our airborne disinfection system. It looks like a Gatling gun. They could be two lamps, up to six lamps from 18 inches to 60 inches. They fit centered in the, uh, in the ductwork and it creates a wall of ultraviolet. And this will provide 
hospital grade air quality. But most facilities don't need that level of disinfection. Having UV lights on the uh, coil in the air handler will do enough for all those applications. Now, to get an understanding of that, it's really to get an understanding of, of air recirculation rates. As I mentioned, UV is based on accumulation of dosages. One sunburn is not going to be an issue, but continual sunburn over some, and someone abuses their, the sun over the course of their life with enough sunburns, there is that lethal dosage which presents itself as, as skin cancer. And UV is exactly the same way. If I'm contacted by a hospital and they say, Aaron, we want to do our operating room, chances are it's 100% makeup air. There's no recirculation. So in that case, I have to deliver that lethal dosage on one pass of air. There's no second, third, or fourth sunburn. So we use typically that Gatling gun, our ADS system, and we size it according to CFM and duct dimensions and the specific pathogen the hospital may want. And we could achieve a 99.99% reduction on a single pass of air, provided we, you know, we deliver that lethal dosage. If it's a facility, if it's an office building, if it's a shopping mall, if it's a school, if it's a house, well, we don't need, comparatively speaking, as much UV because now we have recirculation. And again, with every recirculation rate, we could uh, deliver more UV to the moving airstream to the point of inactivation. So we don't need as much UV for a building or an office or, uh, or a school than we would need for a hospital because of that air recirculation. Growth facilities, greenhouses, agriculture, well, they have a whole other, uh, it's a whole other issue with them. They certainly have a lot of biologicals in the air, but because of the, the humidity and the CO2, they have a lot of air changes. They have up to 50 air recirculation rates per hour. So when we're doing a, 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 a growth facility, we don't even need as much UV, comparatively speaking again, because if we don't deliver that lethal dosage to the microorganism in the air on one pass, well, just wait three minutes because there'll be a third, fourth, and fifth pass. So we're very, very aware of air recirculation rates. And we take that into consideration when we do our modeling. So the first commercial type system that we, which is by far the most um, common is UV in the air handler. So first and foremost, putting UV lights in, on the coil is designed to disinfect the coil, no doubt about it. Installation, really simple. We have half inch EMT conduits that are mounted to you know, 12 inch brackets that are either magnet mount to the side of the air handler or screwed to the frame of the air handler. A lot of players in the UV business, they uh, have very elaborate matrixes and racking and, and unistrut. The hardware, the metalwork is, is, is more expensive than the UV system. Just the freight alone could kill you. That's not what we do. We make it very, very simple, very cost effective. So we're big on magnets. You see examples of magnet mounts in the bottom illustration. So we use magnet mounts with L brackets or our 12 inch brackets mounted directly to the coil itself. And we will size the UV systems depending on the coil. And depending on the size of the coil will depend on how many UV systems we want to install. Now, our systems are available from 12 inch lamps to 60 inch lamps. We have different types of lamps, but our most common is our quartz glass high output lamp, which is the highest caliber lamp. Our power supplies could fire up to four individual lamps. So you may not necessarily need two lamps with two power supplies. It's oftentimes one power supply with two high output lamps. We have our magnet mounts and we have an IP rated uh, plug. Our IP, our plugs are IP68, our power supply is IP54. They can be mounted inside the air handler, outside the air handler, and it's a lifetime guarantee. And the reason why they could, why we could offer them a lifetime guarantee is because they're just so robust. They're just so, they're built so well that these will offer a lifetime of, of performance. When we're sizing an evaporator coil, typically we're putting one UV lamp every 40 to 50 inches. So if you say, Aaron, we want to keep the coil, up to, until COVID-19, that's what it was. It's like, okay, we're keeping our air handler clean. We need a lamp every 40 to 50 inches. Now we want to do air disinfection. COVID-19 is top of mind. We want to you know, disinfect the air. Uh, building owners want to install UV so they can tell their tenants that we're doing something. Uh, uh, employers are telling their employees we're installing UV because it's doing something and it certainly will do something. So what we are uh, addressing now is that we're, we're, we're obviously rule of thumb is one lamp every 40 to 50 inches, but if it's for air disinfection, we have to put more lamps because we have to make, uh, we have to accommodate for the moving air. So we'll put a lamp every 18 to 24 inches. So one lamp every 18 to 24 will obviously give you 
coil disinfection and drain pan disinfection and, and surface disinfection, but it's also going to give you a very nice measurable air disinfection. So that's what we're doing now as far as how we're uh, promoting UV lights in air handlers. I talked earlier about our APCO system for odor control. That's the activated carbon with titanium for odor mitigation without producing ozone. Well, this is our commercial version of APCO. It's an APCO grid that goes on the back end of the lamp, and it's designed to address the odors and VOCs on a continual basis. This is not the system that's going to take care of odors and VOCs on a single pass. So if it's makeup air, this is not the right product. But if it's a, a recirculation application on an ongoing basis, it does an excellent job keeping levels of odors uh, down to a minimum. Again, we have different types of, uh, of hardware for installation. We have obviously the second from the top is our 12 inch bracket, which is our, by far our most popular. Installation is very, very quick and very simple and very easy. We have our magnet mounts, we have reflectors, we have radiometers that measure UV intensity in real time with BMS integration and uh, um, very elaborate controllers. Not needed, not required, but sometimes for those sensitive applications that have to guarantee a certain level of disinfection, uh, they do want it. So we do obviously have it. Now for those high level airborne disinfection applications, those applications where I told you for air handler, we could put one lamp every 18 inches, and it's gonna do a great job continually treating the air. For office buildings, for schools, that is great. It'll continually treat the air as the air recirculates, bringing the level of contamination, including viruses down. But for those customers that want that one pass kill and not have to wait for research, we have our ADS. Available in two formats, grid on the left and axial on the right. And what they do is they address all the air in the duct on a single pass available from 18 inch to 60 inch, from two lamps to six lamps. And if we're doing a huge air handling system, we might need two or three of them, depending. So we do size them on the system itself. And these are exceptionally effective at disinfecting the moving air for any type of biological target. Now, of course, we do have a calculation software. And um, this is something that is available to you that once the calculation software is ran, uh, the calculation will be based on any number of contaminants and certain uh, requirements will be asked of you uh, as far as sizing. You know, if it's an air handling unit for coil disinfection, what's the, uh, you know, what's the, the, the width and, and, uh, and height of the coil? And if it's um, air disinfection for high level for our ADS, what's the CFM and duct dimensions? And we will base those numbers on any number of, of targets. As I mentioned earlier, Almost every biological contaminant from influenza to, uh, to, uh, to Aspirillus niger has a uh, defined dosage for inactivation, so we know what it is. And it's just a question of running the calculations against what the customer would like. So sometimes the customer knows what they want and they say, we wanna you know, base our, our, our kill rates against you know, uh, penicillin as an, as, an, as an example, and we'll do that. But if they don't require or ask, we'll, we'll choose Aspirillus niger uh, which is the hardest of all of all molds, or botrytis cinerea, which is the uh, fungus that causes powdery mildew for growth facilities, as an example. And what you will get in hand is an actual uh, kill rate report. This we call blue calc. And we have two blue calc programs, one for air disinfection on the left and one for coil disinfection on the right. And as you can see from the calculations, everything is given to you. Uh, Real-time kill rate, microwatt dosages, inactivation rates, the uh, specifications, the technical specifications as far as the unit itself, how much wattage, any sort of temperature differential. And it's, it's a very, very powerful tool that uh, you in turn could give to your customers that could quantify UV. And again, I hate going in circles, but what other technology can you give the efficiency before an efficiency report before the unit's even purchased. And that's what uh, this system allows us to do is to give you a report to show to your customers that this is what you're gonna enjoy before the system is even potentially even approved on. So we do have these reports that are very, very, very powerful. We, uh, we quoted more in the first um, week of April than we did all last year. And obviously it was all COVID-19 related. These are for uh, ceilings or walls, disinfecting inwards for unoccupied spaces. Um, 
again, obviously for unoccupied spaces, and this is to um, complement environmental surfaces, disinfect high touch areas, and there are certainly are safety protocols in place, infrared sensors, door interlocks. The system runs for a predetermined amount of time, seven minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And should someone walk in during a disinfection cycle, power will be cut to the, uh, to the system. The top right corner is a, a LASIK eye surgery center. The bottom right corner is an operating room. The left side is a laboratory. And that's an example of the control options that are available for the customer. We, uh, we are coming out with this presently, and we're two, three weeks away. Uh, this is an example of a hospital that we provided a system in, uh, in, in, uh, in a hurry. They needed a UV system when everything started uh, happening in April, uh, COVID-19, obviously, and they were happy to get this in, in hand. This is a self-contained 450 CFM blower with HEPA and, uh, and a, and a pre-filter. It also has our carbon activated APCO system incorporated into the system as well for odor control. It's got a suite of sensors and an LCD display, and it's available as a standalone wall mount, uh, duct in, duct out, collar in, collar out. So it really is an exceptionally flexible system for all kinds of uh, disinfecting and particulate removal. I mentioned we were very, very proud of our engineering and R&D, and this is a big part of it. This is our certified ASHRAE 52.2 test rate. There's only a handful of these in the U.S. Um, I don't know of any uh, uh, private company that actually has one, to be honest with you. Um, the, most of them are, 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 are in universities. Uh, we purchased one from a university. They cost upwards of a half a million dollars uh, U.S., and it's ours. Uh, we have it. It belongs on site, and we do constant testing of our systems. Uh, we tweak it. We test it, and uh, we have the flexibility to, to do so with our 52.2 test rate. So we are we are very very proud of of what we invested into uh, fresh air UV as far as our our design of our of our equipment. I mentioned there are a lot of uh, studies available on our products, and um, you know we have everything from from surface to air, and of course the one that we're so proud of now, which is so time uh, time appropriate, which is the American Journal of Infection Control testing our UV lamps against uh, our on N95 for uh, surface disinfection and extending the useful life of the of the PPE. We are uh, uh, recognized as leaders in ultraviolet. Quite often, we are called upon uh, for uh, for trades, for everything from, from even residential to healthcare, uh, cannabis, um, even a recent article on COVID-19. So when, when the industry looks for UV experts, they usually reach out to Fresh Air. We won the uh, AHR Innovation Award in IAQ this year, 2020 AHR Innovation Award that was presented to us at, in, in Florida. Um, there we are on, on the stage. And of course, we do a lot of presentations as you see today. Uh, oftentimes we're doing it in, in person, but we're getting a lot a lot accomplished with our uh, Zoom presentations. So uh, we did a Zoom presentation uh, a few weeks ago, and we uh, we had 1,300 attendees on that presentation, and then we did a follow up for a thousand, just with the over overflow from the first one. So there is a, a a need, there's a desire, there's a demand, and the reason why you're all here today is because of that demand. And COVID-19. Although we hope it, it, it moves on and we uh, do find a vaccine and life could return to normal, it did do one very important thing, which is bring awareness to the air that we're breathing. And moving forward, uh, you know, next flu season or, or whatever the future may hold for us, when we're talking to our customers about the air quality in our facilities, I would imagine that there'll be a lot more importance placed on that conversation than ever before. And of course, Feel free to reach out to us on social media. Um, we're, we're big on that, and we certainly do put a lot of uh, uh, information out there, a lot of news and events and things of that nature. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Fresh Air. And on that, I do thank you all for joining us on this uh, conversation about ultraviolet and what we can do for you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we're going to open this up to uh, some of the questions that, that came up while we were doing the presentation. Um, the first one is, uh, we had a couple questions about um, air filters. How do the UV lights affect the filter media, and uh, is there a specific type of filter that you need to use? Great question. Um, so, 
typically where we're installing our systems, they're not in line with the filter. Uh, some UV companies will say, put the UV lights on the, um, on the upstream side of the coil, which in that case, you would be in direct line of sight with the filter media. Uh, we always suggest put the UV systems on the downstream side. Number one being that's where the issue is. The wet side of the coil is where there'll be microbial load. The drain pan is on the wet side of the coil. There's no filter media on the wet side of the coil. So there really is no media to irradiate. With that being said, um, any sort of uh, synthetic filter media will be broken down by the ultraviolet light. Oftentimes, healthcare will want to put the UV lights on the HEPAs because the HEPA can be prone to mold and microbial load, and they do use UV light to keep the HEPA sterile and clean. So when it comes time to change it, it's not a biohazard. So it really depends on the type of media that you're using, but typically filters and, and, and other materials, when there's a synthetic, that's where there's issue. Um, hard plastic is not a problem. Rubber is not a problem. Uh, ABS is typically not a problem. There will be discoloration. What you run into is uh, when there's soft materials, pliable materials. So synthetic uh, media of a filter that's soft, that's pliable, will be an issue. Foam would be an issue. Uh, shielding of wiring would be an issue. So just to take this conversation a little bit further, if there's any sensitive materials, example, the unit's mounted in a rooftop package unit, there's a lot of wiring, well, just take some aluminum foil or some aluminum tape and crimp it or shield the uh, sensitive materials and you'll have no problem. So just a little side note on, on filter media and other plastics. Okay, and uh, next question, how do these systems fail? And if they do fail, is there any risk of exposure to the UV lights? So uh, most of our, our large systems, um, have interlocks, safety interlocks. Interlock. So when an access panel or door is open, it cuts power to the UV fixture. So subjecting yourself or radiating yourself should never be a, a, an issue or a concern. Obviously, the units ship with a caution decal or signage that obviously you should be aware that there's a UV system installed, but there should never be a, a time that you are subjected to direct line of sight of, of from the UV. UV could damage, not permanent, it's like a welder's flash, so it could damage your eyes and your skin. Uh, it's it's not permanent, but it's certainly very uncomfortable. So um, you just don't want to subject yourself and usually safety interlocks will, will guarantee that. Uh, as far as any sort of failure, there, there's really no safety issues in regards to failure. Um, we do have, for sensitive applications, when I say sensitive, like, you know, food production, or food processing, we do have Teflon encapsulated lamps, which are lamps that have a, a shield that if a lamp breaks, the glass and mercury cannot escape that Teflon shield, that encapsulation. So uh, it's, it's not a very common option, but one that we do use for sensitive applications where you have to guarantee that should a lamp break, it's not problematic. Thanks. And uh, what's the effectiveness of UV cleaning for deep coils? Um, like, let's say you have a, uh, a deeper than average coil and you are just shining a UV light on the surface of it. How does it get really in there? That's a great question. Uh, of all the materials, now different materials have different levels of reflectivity. And, and some uh, materials that you think would be very highly reflective actually aren't. Mirrors have no reflectivity. Polished stainless have very low reflectivity in contrast to aluminum. Aluminum has a very high coefficient of reflectivity. So we're actually very lucky that of all the materials for a coil to be manufactured out of, it's aluminum. So UV does penetrate through the coil, but with every reflectance, there is a loss. Uh, there is a loss. So uh, typically, uh, coils that let's say are over 20 inches deep, you may want to have a, a, an additional row on the other side, not necessarily as many rows as the other, as, as the first side, but you may want to complement by having lamps on both sides. But typically, um, the UV light, given enough time, that's what it's all about, it's exposure time, will over time penetrate through that coil. 
but we do have to make sure we have enough lamps on that coil. And uh, what you know, taking that 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 coil into consideration, we may want to put more lamps than we typically would uh, if it is an abnormally deep coil. Okay, and uh, the last one that we have here is what's the expectancy of the life expectancy of the UV light itself? Uh, yeah, different. There's different types of lamps out there. We use what, what is called a, a, a hard quartz glass lamp, mercury vapor quartz glass lamp, which is the highest quality of ultraviolet. There's soft glass, and there's all kinds of little, you know, little differentiators on lamps. Uh, there's there's uh, getters, and there's different technologies that you could put into a lamp. Uh, like filters into a lamp that actually filters out the gas, the bad gas as the lamp ages, and and retards solarization, which degrades the glass as the lamp ages. So uh, you know, 20 years ago, you couldn't get more than a year from the lamp. Our lamps are are two years, and some of our lamps even go to three years. So uh, our standard commercial high output lamp is a two year lamp, uh, but the uh, technology that has gone into these lamps over the last few years have are incredible. So they do last much longer than they ever have. That, but to caution you, a lamp could last for 20 years, but the invisible wavelength of ultraviolet does decrease with age. So after two or three years of operation, the lamp is still going to be on, but the ultraviolet has decreased to the point that it should be replaced. Okay. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, uh, you can reach out to your Odell rep, or you can email me directly, and I'll make sure that uh, that we get the answers for you, either from us or from Aaron. Um, just a reminder that, like all of our webinars, this one will be available on our website, likely sometime tomorrow, if you want to revisit and uh, maybe go over a few things that um, that we went over today. And uh, yeah, any any last comments there, Aaron? Um, no, I, I appreciate the time Odell that you afforded uh, myself and, and your customers. And um, it's just a very, very different time. I've been doing ultraviolet for a long time now. I've seen uh, many pandemics come and go. Um, the urgency with Ebola, anthrax in 2001. And there was always, a, um, you know, um, a, you know, there was a spike and then it, it, the, the awareness came down a bit. Uh, I don't really see that happening here with COVID-19. There is such a, an urgency uh, and importance put now on, on air quality. And uh, I believe ultraviolet is, is the perfect tool to complement your, your customer's filters. So a good quality filtration, ultraviolet, at that point, you're doing all you could possibly do as far as the air quality within the building or facility. Awesome. Well, on behalf of our team here at Odell, I want to thank you and I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us for this edition of Isolation Intelligence. Just a last comment. Uh, everyone at Odell uh, on the sales team has been trained with the Blue Calc program. So if you have a system that you want to look at putting a UV light into or a UV filtration system, um, we can look at that ourselves and we can help you out and uh, figure out pricing, figure out uh, all the logistics of it. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll sign off. Take care, Aaron. Take care, everybody. Thank you.